grandmother was baking cookies with her granddaughter. And the little girl said, Grandma, how old are you? The grandmother said, Honey, when you get to be my age, you don't tell anyone how old you are. She said, OK. But a few minutes later, the grandmother noticed the granddaughter was missing, so she went looking for her, finally found the granddaughter in the grandmother's bedroom, on the grandmother's bed, with the contents of the grandmother's purse spilled out all over the bed. The little girl was peering intensely at her grandma's driver's license, so when grandma walked in, she said, Grandma, you're 73. She said, that's right, honey, how did you know that? She said, well, I looked at the year you were born and I did the math. She looked back at the driver's license and said, I see you also got an F in sex. I like to tell that story because I found a lot of Christians believe they got an F in sex. Sex is a unique human experience that often represents both the highest and lowest points of our life. Points we feel more alive than we've ever felt before and perhaps closer to anyone than we've ever felt before. But also, it represents points of our greatest shame, greatest guilt, and even abuse. And when something has such conflicting emotions within us, it's often difficult for us to look honestly inside and to wonder what could God have to say about it. We just want to push it away. But I believe spiritual health is found by bringing God into every aspect of our marriage, including this one. So come with me. There's a room I want to show you. I can think of no more appropriate place for this discussion than right here in the bedroom. It's the one room where a lot of couples think God doesn't belong or they would never even think to talk about God here. And yet God has a lot to say about the sexual relationship between a husband and a wife. We might be uncomfortable talking about sex, but the Bible is not. In fact, it's almost shocking how explicit the Bible can be, not only in celebrating our sexuality, but talking honestly about the force that sex can be in a life. It will be either a force for good or a force for ill. Song of Songs talks about this. When we're told, I liken you, my darling, to a mare harnessed to one of the chariots of Pharaoh. Now, if you know the historical situation, you would realize that a mare never pulled one of the Pharaoh's chariots. They wanted to go as fast as possible so they would always find the best stallions to pull the Pharaoh's chariots. So why would a mare be fastened? Well, what they discovered, and I apologize in advance if this makes some of you queasy. Keep in mind, this isn't my idea. I'm simply telling you what scripture says. They found that when they would harness one of the mares to the Pharaoh's chariots, it literally whipped the stallions into a sexual frenzy and upped their horsepower. They could pull the chariot faster when they were next to a mare than when they weren't. And it's a picture of a man's life who's in a healthy sexual relationship with his wife. A man who's sexually fulfilled is a better father. He's more focused on his kids. He tends to be a better husband. He's a better worker. He can even be a better Christian and more faithful in his spiritual disciplines. But the reverse, sadly, is also true. One of the best ways to zap a man's strength is to give him a sexual addiction or for him to be involved in any sexual expression outside of marriage. He spends less time with his children. I talked to a man one time and he realized things had gone way too far when he was trolling on the internet for images and he heard his family coming home earlier than expected and he literally regretted that his family was home. Whenever we regret seeing our family come home, we know our priorities have become twisted. I remember talking to another man, a professional in a very respected profession. And he was talking to me about how it was so difficult for him to finish a task at work. We kept trying to talk about several causes and then finally uncovered what was really going on. He eventually admitted that he could spend 20 to 30 hours a week, again, trolling the internet for images. So of course he wasn't able to finish the task at work. Just as a sexually fulfilled man has energy to focus on family and work, a sexual addiction pulls us away. The very thing that God designed to preserve our hearts and cement our affections at home with our wives, protecting our children, Satan would use to pull us away from being effective workers, from being involved husbands, from being caring fathers or caring mothers. In fact, the Bible presents sexual fulfillment as a blessing and a prayer. In Proverbs 5, 18 through 19, we read, May you rejoice in the wife of your youth. 
a loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breast satisfy you always. When you look in the Hebrew, that passage, may you ever be captivated by her love, has a real intense sense about it. In fact, two Old Testament commentators have likened it to a morally permissible love ecstasy. What they're saying here is it's a picture of a man who was literally struck dumb at the sight of his wife's naked body. Maybe she's walking out of the shower or she's crawling into bed. At that moment, she is all that exists for him. A nuclear bomb could go off next door and he might not even see it because he's so enthralled with her beauty. And the Bible presents this as a blessing and a prayer. May you ever have this. May you rejoice in this. This is God's will for you. As shocking as it may sound to some of us, God doesn't turn his eyes when a married couple goes to bed. There's nothing shameful about it. There's nothing naughty or sinful about it. It's what God designed. It's what God blesses. And it's what his word celebrates. So in this session, I want us to talk about how we can gain the spiritual benefit of a very physical relationship, the sexual relationship between a husband and a wife. The first thing I want to talk about is how sex can be a powerful force for intimacy between a husband and a wife. If you were to scope a male brain and a female brain with a number of the instruments that neurologists use today, you would understand that women have up to 10 times more oxytocin coursing through their brain than the average man. Oxytocin is a loyal bonding chemical. It's why women often connect relationally so much better than men do. It's why you often see women at a Starbucks, for instance, looking in each other's eyes with all of the empathy, or why women often bond with children more quickly than a man might bond with his child. You don't usually see men staring in each other's eyes like that. Uh, when us men get together, we tend to be hitting something or shooting something. You know, we're hitting a golf ball or shooting pheasant or deer. But there's one time in a man's experience when his levels of oxytocin actually reach that of his wife's, and that's immediately following a sexual encounter. Women, why do your husbands want to have sex with you so often? Whether they realize this consciously or not, the reality is they never feel closer to you than immediately following the sexual encounter. Now, you might wish it wasn't that way. You might wish your husband felt closest to you after he fixed the garbage disposal or maybe after he came home from a frustrating episode at work and spent 45 minutes talking about his feelings and how he felt discounted by his boss and dismissed by his coworkers. But I'm sorry, I didn't create your husband, God did. And this is how God created your husband. And in many ways, I think it's a brilliant design that God has given men a hormonal motivation to stay intimate with their wives. Because any wise husband will understand that to be sexually active with our wives, we need to be relationally aware. We need to be relationally connected as well. We're not altruistic beings by nature. In fact, we're sinful, rebellious, and independent. So God has given us a very physical urge to keep the spiritual and relational and emotional intimacy of our marriage intact and growing. It's a brilliant design that we can use sex as a tool to renew our affection for each other. Because just as we discussed in earlier sessions that the romantic attraction fades, this is one thing that God has designed that renews our attraction for each other, that renews our commitment, our sense of celebration, and our sense of enjoying each other. A second way that sexuality can be so spiritually formative in our life is that it can build in us the spirit of giving. Now, in many cases, Giving is a last thing that's a part of sexuality, and that's very sadly the case. I have a friend who probably has the cleanest sexual history of any man I've ever known. He grew up in a strict religious tradition where boys and girls would never swim or dance together. So on the day he got married, he had kissed only one woman other than his future bride, and that was his mother. We were stopping at a fast food restaurant one time when there's a young kid behind the counter, and he saw that we both had wedding rings on. He said, you both have wives? We said, yeah. We're both married. He said, well, tell me, is it true what they say about being married, that your sex life gets better after you're married? I remember my friend choking, saying, <clears throat> mine sure did, because, of course, he didn't have anything even resembling a sex life before he got married. 
And then the young man said, well, it's tough being single. I know this much. I'm not getting any tonight. And that's such an offensive statement to God's creative order that we would look at sex as if I'm not getting any tonight. But sadly, what I see happen so often is that men as singles will develop a predatory attitude towards sexuality. Am I going to get any? Am I going to get this? Am I going to get that? And then they bring that same attitude into marriage and poison their relationship with their wife because it becomes all about a demand. It becomes all about an expectation. They never think of it as a gift that they can give to their spouse. And so they never act in the spirit of giving. It's always in the spirit of demanding. And what God intended as a blessing becomes a burden that weighs the marriage down. I believe that God created sex as a gift that we can give to our spouse that no one else can give. That creates a sense of loyalty, a sense of exclusiveness. It's a gift to be given. But because of that, it also brings up an element of power within a marriage. That's the power of denial. It dawned on me one time that the only sexual experience my wife can enjoy is the sexual experience I choose to give her. Anything I deny her, by definition as a Christian, becomes an absolute denial. If I say I'm not available, it's not as if there's somewhere else she can go. If I say you can shop on this shelf but not that shelf, it's not like she has any other options. And because of the power of denial, power can become a real problem within many marriages because that old adage about how power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely is as true in the marriage bed as it is anywhere else. But the Bible gives us a lot of guidance about how we should responsibly, generously, in a godly way, handle any power that is given to us. We're told in John chapter 13, that's the story of the Last Supper, that Jesus knew full well all power in heaven and earth had been placed under his feet. And then how did Jesus use that power? Well, Scripture tells us that he got up from the table, wrapped a towel around his waist, and he washed the feet of his disciples. Now, one of those disciples still present, we know this from the chronology of the Gospels, was Judas, the man who was about to betray him. And yet here is Jesus fully knowing what Judas was about to do and still taking Judas' dirty feet into his lap and with his own hands rubbing the dirt off of Judas' ankles and around his feet and from his toes. Can you even imagine Jesus sitting there sort of twisting Judas' ankle or pulling apart his toes saying, I know what you're about to do. We can't even imagine that, can we? And Jesus gives us a model here how we are called to act generously, to use any power given us to invite people into relationship, not as payback, not as trying to score points or make a statement. The stereotype is often that the husband wants sex more often than the wife, and there's some physiological reasons for that. But I've seen a growing issue where often wives are feeling diminished because their husbands seem to have lost their appetite to be intimate with them. But whether it's the husband who wants sex more often or the wife who wants sex more often, I found out one thing is pretty much true. Whoever wants sex the least has the most power in bed. And sometimes that, of course, is going to be the wife. Sometimes it will be the husband. In any case, I hope we'll use that power to serve, to bless, to love, to be generous, to work, and to operate, and to be married with the virtues of Christ. Not selfishness, not power, not condescension. If sex is about giving, it also speaks much about the quality of the experience and not just the quantity. Sometimes men will say, well, Gary, I want to give the gift of sex to my wife, but she won't open the present. And that often tells me if that's the case, that they may still have a bit of that predatory attitude and they haven't developed a sexual experience that is giving and fulfilling to the wife. I had a wife come up to me one time and say, Gary, if my husband would just pray with me, he wouldn't be able to handle me in bed. He'd be crying uncle long before the night is through. In fact, she said we'd have to put a fire extinguisher above the headboard to put out the heat. Guys, what she's saying is this, before you touch my body, touch my soul. 
And I don't think she's atypical. I think that's the normal response. A woman is saying, for me to be intimate with you sexually, I want to be spiritually connected with you. I want to be emotionally connected with you. So that means I have to find out what is pleasing to my wife. That's my attitude. What is a fulfilling sexual experience for her? I may recognize that my past life or whatever may have conditioned me to be very selfish in bed rather than having the godly attitude of generosity and service. And I need to grow in that area so that it becomes an experience that blesses my wife. Here's a question I want to leave you with when we look at sex as something that we are to give our spouse, not demand or take. If God looked at nothing other than how I treat his daughter in bed, and for you women, his son in bed. Would he say, I'm a mature Christian operating with the virtues of Christ, generosity, kindness, patience, love, purity? Or would he say, I don't even recognize you? If he didn't look at how often I prayed or how much I read the Bible or how frequently I share my faith, if he only looked at how I treat my spouse, his child in bed, would he be pleased that I am honoring him in my marriage? Am I keeping the marriage bed pure? That's not just about physical actions. It speaks about inner realities as well. Finally, another way that sex is spiritually formative in a marriage is that it teaches us about building hearts of faithfulness. It's not a coincidence the most typical sin for a man in regards to his sexuality is to become a voyeur. What is happening in that situation? A man who becomes a voyeur is saying, it's not enough for me to be satisfied by a woman. I want to be satisfied by women in general. And so he'll let his mind roam. He'll let his thoughts roam. He'll let his eyes roam. He wants to take satisfaction from women in general, and he develops a predatory attitude. And what's the most typical sin that Scripture would warn women against in regards to their sexuality? That's to become an exhibitionist. The Bible urges women to dress modestly. What's happening in that situation? Well, a woman who dresses immodestly and who flirts with other men is saying, it's not enough for me to be adored and wanted and desired by a man. I want to know that I can still attract men in general. So what happens here is that the husband and the wife in those situations are literally leaking the sexual desire that God intended to keep their marriage intact. It's like this. Let's say my wife cooked one of my favorite meals, which for me would be a nice cooked steak, maybe a baked potato. And I didn't know that she was going to cook me this great meal. So about an hour before the meal, I'd had a bag of potato chips, maybe drank a Pepsi, had a bag of M&Ms, and I really wasn't hungry at all. My wife put down this wonderful meal in front of me, and she knows me well enough. She's going to see how I'm treating that meal, and she's going to say to herself, he's been snacking. And she's going to think, why should I go to all of this trouble to cook this great meal if he's off snacking somewhere else? Guys, don't mess with your wife's sense of intuition. They sense when our eyes roam. They sense when our hearts stray. They know if we are focused on them, or if we're letting ourselves be unfaithful, it is our spiritual duty as their husband to be locked in on them, to adore them only. Sexual taste is something that's cultivated, and if you're trying to cultivate sexual interest outside of your marriage, you'll never be fully satisfied in your marriage. I've been a lifelong fan of sports, and because of that, I've been a lifelong subscriber to Sports Illustrated. And every February, they have an issue that comes out that has nothing to do with sports. It's right after the Super Bowl and before spring training camp opens up for baseball. It's the famous swimsuit issue, which now you can ask them not to send and they won't. But I remember in previous years when that would arrive, and Sports Illustrated arrives at our post office box, and my wife and I have pretty much a routine where I'll usually pick up the mail and I leave a pile in the kitchen and my wife goes through it because she deposits the checks or pays the bills. And then she leaves me the letters that I need to answer. Well, I remember Sports Illustrated being in there one year, and I left everything in the kitchen. A couple days went by. I didn't think anything of it. And then I went down to my office one morning, and over my keyboard was draped this. It's the back page column for Sports Illustrated. It used to be written by Rick Riley. And my wife walked into my office, and I held this up, and I said to Lisa, Lisa, what's this? She said, oh, that's the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue. 
I remember saying, it seemed to me a little thicker when I pulled it out of the mailbox. And she said, yeah, but I thought that's all you really needed to know. Well, you know what? Here's why I applaud her actions. She's saying, Gary, I will give myself to you unreservedly, but I want you to focus only on me. Biblically speaking, that is the only pathway to satisfaction. The husband giving himself unreservedly and faithfully to his wife. The wife giving herself unreservedly, faithfully, and generously to her husband. And when we do that, wonderful things happen to us inside. This sense of faithfulness is one of the tools that God has given us to grow spiritually within marriage. The most healthy thing that a man or a woman can do who's struggling sexually with looking elsewhere is to take all of that energy that they use to hide from their spouse, whether it's on the internet or covert phone calls or just fascination with romantic novels or something like that, and to take that energy and time and focus on crafting a meaningful and generous sexual relationship with their spouse. Take all of that energy and use it to build up your home instead of threaten it, to affirm your spouse instead of to steal from them. Here's what I believe happens when we do that. We become more like Jesus Christ. Sex is a powerful experience. It will shape our souls. I believe it's so powerful that we'll leave every sexual experience a little more selfish, a little more demanding, a little more demeaning, or a little more noble, a little more selfless, a little more generous. It crafts our hearts in one of the most intimate aspects of human experience. God designed it that way. Sex can build us up or it can destroy us. How does it build us up? It builds us up when we invite God into the most intimate aspects of our life and marriage, even in the bedroom.